But Clara, uh, how do you visualize the cyber pandemic unfolding? Uh, are you also of the opinion that we are in the middle of one? But what we have also seen is uh, for sure an infodemic unfolding. Fake news, post-truth world, misinformation, synthetic data. Uh, how can private sector, government, and communities collaborate to respond to these uh, multiple challenges that uh, today uh, we are confronting? Yeah, first off, it's such a pleasure to be here um, and speak with such an esteemed set of panelists. Um, I definitely want to zone in on the info pandemic, which is a whole nother issue very much tied to cyber. Um, and, um, you know, I will start with, you know, very U.S. perspective because that's where I'm from. Um, today, more than 75 percent of Americans are online with more and more personal information and data uploaded per minute to the cloud. The U.S. has also had a significant supply chain problem with the COVID-19 pandemic and such. Most people are working from home. You know, I know in Asia that there is a lot more people actually going back to offices. But today in the U.S., most people, even large companies, are working from home using insecure networks uh, that they share, you know, Know, Wi-Fi networks they share with the rest of their family. And a lot of companies, especially smaller businesses, are not adequately prepared. I think one of the biggest similarities between the physical pandemic and the virtual one is it attacks the most vulnerable groups in any society. Um, you see seniors, the most vulnerable, being most susceptible to fake news online, clicking on clickbait content, and often falling for scams that create huge vulnerabilities in their IoT systems. The same goes for their vulnerabilities um, to the COVID pandemic. And so I think we have to think about you know, vulnerable groups in, in similar ways as well. Um, but to touch upon what others have already said, supply chain um, is really the core, I think, of 2021 and this year. Um, it's really how do we think about the cyber pandemic in a supply chain lens. Um, and when we think about supply chain, the one thing that I don't think other panelists have covered is really the talent gap. So um, I'm a disinformation researcher, and I actually joined U.S. government through a program at the White House that brings top entrepreneurs and technologists to do a term of service. And I have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley. Um, today, only 3% of federal tech workers in the U.S. are under the age of 30, with around 50% of the federal workforce actually going into retirement soon. And in 2019, I worked with uh, the first director of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Agency, Chris Krebs, the stand of the agency, where we saw a huge gap in talent uh, that was there to, to have a workforce that was ready. And without a talent pool ready, it's very impossible to, to resolve any kind of major cyber issue. Um, and it was very shocking to me going into U.S. government to see the amount of vulnerabilities, uh, the lack of training, the lack of um, ability for a lot of federal workers to really understand how to use IT in a safe and secure way. And we are as strong as our weakest link, right? Um, so private-public partnership is so important. Um, and um, more important now than ever, especially thinking about how do we do that for federal workers. And that extends to every single country where a lot of the federal workforce is, is seniors and older populations that are using the same IT systems that we are. The same extends to businesses today that have never been online, um, that are most hurt. There are small businesses that are trying to do food delivery online, and they're trying to use IT systems for the first time. Um, and they are also especially vulnerable. Um, to expand upon the content and infodemic side, um, you know, it's propelled the pandemic significantly. Um, you can imagine COVID misinformation um, and figuring out whether you should or should not wear masks uh, and disinformation spreading about um, conspiracy theories around mask wearing. Those are, those are examples of where it can actually exaggerate a physical pandemic. Um, what's been really interesting to actually watch the last few years is around this topic of the info pandemic, there's a new breed of um, there's a new breed of career technologists coming out called open source researchers. Um, they've been around for a long time, but you know we've seen a lot of these open source researchers, especially in think tanks and in places like the Digital Forensic Research Lab, being able to identify uh, different kinds of info campaigns that state-backed actors are, are acting upon and playing a critical, war, a critical role working with major cybersecurity companies, major social media companies, and are also working with governments. And I think seeing that explosion of so many great people that want to play a role in really ensuring the cyber hygiene of the internet is, is so wonderful and heartwarming um, for me. 
Um, one of the things that um, was also especially challenging in the U.S. was, you know, uh, one one sub example is really around election security, which I think paints a lot of picture about a cyber pandemic we faced, where you not only had um, something that you know we now deem a critical infrastructure announced, but you had uh, you had some vulnerabilities around physical security and disinformation around whether physical systems were secure. Um, in 2015, you know, the Ukraine power grid was hacked, and imagine uh, you know the the kinds of supply chain. Uh, consequences um, that happened. And that's something that happened in 2018, 2020, was a lot of people online having distrust in physical systems, even if it was secure, that that info pandemic, that disinformation has had huge impact in the ability of everyday people to trust a system that is secure. And I think this is going to be the biggest challenge ahead, is, is really thinking about how to how to resolve that. Thank you, Clara. I'm going to 